So you have six months and you want to learn as much about computational neuroscience as possible, how to do it and where to get started. In today's video, I really want to give you three tips to learn computational neuroscience a little bit faster, where to get started and give you some resources. So hi, I'm Charlotte Fresa, a third year PhD student in computational neuroscience. And a lot of you have asked me in the comments, how do I get started with computational neuroscience? How do I learn it a little bit faster? And I have made two tutorials on where to find resources and books, etc., on learning computational neuroscience. But today I want to talk a little bit about the mindset of programming and also computational neuroscience and how to get better at that, such that you may increase your learning speed for computational neuroscience overall. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is the mindset shift. So already in the sentence, how do I learn computational neuroscience faster? I think there's a tiny problem and that's the concept of learning. So I I think when you want to learn something, you're really in this mindset of a student. And I think a lot of you are probably students. So that's where that comes from. But computational neuroscience is still in its infancy. The field hasn't started for that long. So the things that are being discovered follow each other up so fast that the things that were maybe common knowledge five years ago could be proven wrong today. And I think that's a major shift you have to make if you want to start in a field of computational neuroscience. So instead of the word learn, I would use the word creating. So how can I create computational neuroscience faster? And that's because probably if you have any type of skill and you start in the field right now, you could actually add quite tremendously because the field is so young. So instead of looking at theoretical textbooks, then I would actually look at papers that were published this year. And for example, you can use the website Scopus and just list the articles from the highest cited rate to the lowest. And if you kind of go through those or look at some reviews in computational neuroscience, you will get a sense of what the field is currently looking for or where the general consensus currently is within the field. And the second thing I want to talk about is leaning into your strengths. So a lot of videos that I've made as well are emphasizing the ability to program. So if you want to do computational neuroscience, you have to be quite a good programmer. But something that I've seen in the comments is that people really go for programming. But the thing you have to consider that if you want to be the best at computational neuroscience or you want to get really good at it and your only skill is programming, you need to be a damn good programmer to really stand out. And that's because within the computational neuroscience sphere, but also within the AI sphere, there are a lot of people that are trained as programmers from the start. So I've met a lot of PhD students and postdocs that are amazing programmers. But the thing is, if you're starting programming a little bit at a later age, the chances of you becoming as good as those programmers are quite slim unless you spend like eight hours a day programming. So instead of following the path of becoming the best programmer and in that way standing out with your skills, I would actually lean into the skills that you already have. So for example, if you are already doing a bachelor right now in for example biology, psychology or physics, I would lean more on those skills. So something that I've noticed is if you're in the top 25% of one of these skills and you're a really good programmer, are these combined skills actually make you pretty unique within the sphere of computational neuroscience. So to give you an example, like my background is in physics and I would say I'm pretty good at mathematics. So I may not be the best programmer, but within the realm that I operate, I am quite fast at solving mathematical equations or understanding certain physics concepts. And that together combined with my decent programming skills give me a good skill set to be able to create new work in computational neuroscience. So I would advise you to really start thinking about what unique skills you have that you can bring on top of your programming skills to create some new work in computational neuroscience. And one way that I really like to dive into this mindset is by using this board from Miro that I'm going to show you right now. So within Miro, you have these different types of boards to get conversations going and all these things. But one that I really like is this personas board. And the personas board is usually used to create a character of a client, for example, that you want. But I find it also pretty good to understand your own motivations and mindset. So 
So for example, I created a persona board for myself. And the first step, what you do is you look at your own action, actions, motivations, and pains. And I think by understanding this, you can kind of see where your strengths are as well. So the first step is to fill in what you do every day. So for me, I have to research for my thesis every day and write code and think and teach. And then why I do it. So my main motivation for doing science actually is to learn as much as possible, but also to teach as much as possible. I enjoy both of these facets of science and combining them in my PhD is really nice. So my strengths for me, that's really mathematics and programming. I think I'm quite good at both of them. Not the best, but quite good. And I think it's also good to consider what is stopping you. So for me, definitely the reason why I'm not creating as much science as I could be is probably energy. I don't have all the energy in the world and also time. I like to spend my time on other things as well. So what convinces me? These are your values. And for me, they're wisdom and creativity. I think usually when I decide to endeavor on certain projects or want to do something, I usually pick if this is following the value of wisdom or the value of creativity. And I do think these are actually intertwined, if you really think about it. What or who informs me? So these are the people within your realm that kind of help and support the goals that you want to reach. So for me, that's definitely my professor and my fellow PhD students. Then uh, where am I right now? So I'm usually, where are you every day in time? So I'm usually in the office or in the train lately. And what's my day to day? So coding, teaching, friends, family, dance and yoga. So yeah, this is just an example of how I filled in this board and you don't have to use this board You can also use pen and paper, but really thinking about your strengths How you live your day-to-day -day life who is helping you who guides you along I think is a really good way to see and pinpoint where Weaknesses are in your day and perhaps change them such that you can learn everything you want to a little bit faster Then the third tip I want to give you so I've now talked about like leaning into your strengths and probably you're wondering but what if I have a lot of gaps in my neuroscience knowledge for example or my psychology knowledge or my mathematics knowledge and that's where I would try to surround yourself by experts so for example within my lab there are people from many different backgrounds and I think most of us are an expert at a certain part in computational neuroscience but I don't think all of us are actually really good at everything and something that I've noticed this is that students that really thrive as a PhD are actually pretty good at finding people that can help them answer certain questions. So for example, right now we're starting on a project on cognitive variables and I don't know that much about cognition. I don't know exactly how these tests are measured or why the tests were set up the way they are. And of course I could read everything about it and become an expert on cognition or I could just ask someone that's already an expert to spend about an hour of their time with me and perhaps I buy them a coffee or something and teach me everything they know and you will notice that the knowledge you have is not only the knowledge you have as an individual but kind of the knowledge of your community at that point and if you're of course in a situation that you cannot easily connect with a lot of people it's also po possible to find for example people online that can help you find this knowledge so I also created a website where I try to give tips on computational neuroscience every week and help you learn a few of the basics skills but of course you can also find people that you really like or professors on Twitter and follow them and read their papers and I think this way you get this community knowledge that hopefully helps you learn these type of things a lot faster so yeah these were three tips I have for changing your mindset around learning computational neuroscience I hope they helped a little bit if you have any other questions I would love to answer them so please put them down in the comments below and otherwise see you next week bye